Heavenly Father, you've given us your holy scriptures for our learning, and so we pray by your Holy Spirit that you would now assist us so to hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest this, your holy word, that we may be changed more and more to be like Jesus for the sake of the world. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Do you pray for the Lord to raise up pastors among us? Do you pray for the Lord to raise up pastors among us? Now, just a quick note about terminology. I know we're in an Anglican church and we use funny words. So when I say pastors, it's the same meaning as minister, as priest, as clergy, as elder, pastor. Pastor is just a good word. I'll come back to that later on. But when I say pastor, I mean all of that. Those who are called to teach and preach and lead as ordained leaders in the church. Do you pray for the Lord to raise up pastors? Well, you should because it's a command. Jesus has commanded his church to pray for the raising up of pastors. In Luke chapter 10, verse 2, Jesus says to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray then to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers, laborers into his harvest. It's a command. You should also be praying this because it's for your equipping. It's for your own good. Our own good is the church. Because we're told in Ephesians chapter 4 that Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to the church as gifts. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. This is the work of the pastors among us. Now, I know you'll say we're all ministers, right? It's true. We're all, in that sense, ministers. In a first Peter chapter 2 sense that you are a chosen race, a holy royal priesthood, a holy people, that this, what the reformers would have called the priesthood of all believers, it's true. We all have ministry. We're all sharing in that priesthood of all believers. And yet there are still those who are called by the Holy Spirit to be set apart, like the Levites. Like the Levites in Israel set apart to be holy unto the Lord, completely given over to a life devoted to the Lord. The Levites are mine, says the Lord. Now, let's be clear. Set apart doesn't mean set alone. It doesn't mean that the clergy do all the ministry and everyone else just watches. Right? We're to do this together. We saw that this week with Vacation Bible School opening up. After two years, hundreds of kids, but hundreds of volunteers all serving together. We are the church together in service. Clergy are not set alone. That's not what set apart means. And clergy are also not set above. Clergy are set apart to be servants. There's this thing that happens actually at an ordination service when the Lord ordains a person as a deacon, a priest, or a bishop. And it happens at installations and induction service as well, where the clergy have to lay prostrate. I mean, see, it's, it's a really awkward, when you're wearing a dress, there is no beautiful way of doing this, okay? That's the point. You, you have to lay down, prostrate before the Lord, and everybody's looking at you. I remember when I was being inducted, my children who'd never seen me do this before cried out to their mother, what is daddy doing? <laughs> and then worst of all, you have to get up. <laughs> it's humiliating on purpose. Set apart does not mean set above. It's, if anything, set below to serve. See, 
our pastors, those God calls, are set apart. And here's Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, as we continue our journey through Acts, gives us a picture of what set apart looks like. It's just a snapshot. It's not exhaustive, but it's a little snapshot into what does set apart, ordained, consecrated for ministry look like. And yes, if you think, why are you preaching this? Like, I'm not clergy. Why? You're wasting a Sunday, Father Paul. No, this is for the whole church. We're to be praying for this. And so here's Acts chapter 13. If you've got your Bibles or your, prayer or your um, Bible, Bibles in the pews, Acts chapter 13, verse one, we read that now... In, it was so that in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Mene and the lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so after fasting, And praying, they laid hands on them and sent them out. And so being sent by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and took a ship to Cyprus. And when they landed in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. And they had John Mark to assist them. And when they'd made all their way through the island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician named Bar-Jesus a Jewish false prophet. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a intelligent man who'd summoned Saul and Barnabas to hear the word of God. But Elymas the magician, because that's what his name means, opposed them and sought to turn the proconsul from the faith. And so Saul, whose name was also Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceits and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for some time. And immediately, Mist and darkness fell upon him, and he was searching, seeking people to lead him by the hand. But the proconsul believed. When he saw what had happened, he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So here's what we see about pastors being set apart by the Holy Spirit. First thing we see here in Acts chapter 13, is that pastors are sent by the Holy Spirit, not sent by the church. I'll explain. Sent by the Holy Spirit. But also, those pastors who are sent by the Holy Spirit are strengthened by the Holy Spirit. This is not a weak ministry. This is a ministry of strength in the Holy Spirit. But not only are they sent by the Holy Spirit and strengthened by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit speaks through their ministry. The Holy Spirit saves the world and speaks through their ministry. See, first, pastors are sent by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse three. Verse three says that after they, the church, had laid hands on them after fasting and praying, they, the church, sent them out. Okay, the church sent them. But then verse four says, so being sent by the Holy Spirit, they went. And you want to say, well, Verse three said the church sent them. Verse four said the Holy Spirit sent them, which is which? Did the church send Saul and Barnabas or did the Holy Spirit send Saul and Barnabas? And the answer is yes, yes. See, the truth is that the church sent Saul and Barnabas at the Spirit's leading. They responded to the Spirit's sending. It was in verse two that we're told that The Holy Spirit spoke saying, set apart for me Saul and Barnabas for the work that I have called them to do. It is the Spirit's call. The Spirit's call on a life that sends a person into ministry. We need to remember this because when you look at who God sends again and again, 
We may be surprised. He sends Barnabas and Saul. Well, Barnabas, that maybe makes sense. But Saul? Saul, who we're told was unimpressive. Uh, Second uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, the church in Corinth complaining about Paul will say that though he's strong in his letters, he's weak in physical presence and his speech comes to nothing. In other words, this is not a strong, present, charismatic leader. And let's be clear also that Saul has a past. Chapter 9, verse 13, Saul's own conversion experience on the road to Damascus. What does Ananias say to God when God says, okay, you need to go find Saul of Tarsus and lay hands on him so that his blindness can be taken away? Ananias wants to tell the Lord something about Saul that maybe the Lord doesn't know. He says, you know, Lord, I, I have been told all the evil this man has done. And what does God say in verse 15 of chapter nine? Go. Because I've convinced you? No, go. Because he is my chosen instrument to bring the gospel before the Gentiles and the kings of the earth and many nations. See, so often we forget that the church doesn't call people. The church hears the Spirit's call on a person's life. We are responsive to the Spirit's initiative. So often if it was left up to us, we would go for charisma, we'd go for competency, we'd go for credentials, but instead the church needs to listen for call. The call from God. The amazing call from God. Here is Saul of Tarsus, who we're told in this passage for the first time in chapter 13 is called Paul. He's got another name. Now, don't be mistaken. This is not a renaming of Paul, as some have said. Paul, like Saul, like so many Jews, had a Gentile or Greek name as well. The reason this Greek name is now put in front of us is he's finally living into the call that God has put on his life. He is becoming in this moment the true apostle to the Gentiles. And from this point on in the book of Acts, he will never be called Saul again. He will be Paul because he's going to be completely living into this call, this incredible call from God. And notice as well that it's not only that he will be Paul from now on to the Gentiles, but suddenly he's taken a senior place of leadership. The rest of the book is kind of about him and what God is doing through Paul. No longer is it Barnabas and Saul. It's, if anything is referenced to Barnabas, it'll be Paul and Barnabas, but more often simply Paul and his companions. Saul of Tarsus has been chosen into this role to be set apart for this main central leadership role in the life of the early church. And this is the first of his missionary journeys. He's begun. It's come out of Antioch. He's on his first of three missionary journeys. He's going to travel, and we're going to walk through this for the rest of the year with the first, second, third missionary journey. He's going to travel 10,000 miles. And this is the ancient Near East, okay? 10,000 miles over 11 years, and he's going to plant 14 churches. This is what Paul's life looks like before God, called and chosen, sent by God. Oh, the church needs to listen carefully. Sometimes we don't listen well. I was faced with that not long ago when there had been a young man who had come to me to, years ago to uh, discern holy orders. And I prayerfully, but wrongly, said, I don't see it. I, I don't see a call to priesthood for you. I don't see you called to be a pastor. I just, I don't see it. And so he went off to seminary anyways, and I kind of reluctantly said, well, go ahead, but just know that I'm not really supporting this. I don't think this is God's will, but you know, I'm not the only voice in your life. I mean, how depressing must that have been? Like your rector saying, I don't really think the call's here, but go off to seminary, try and figure it out. Well, it wasn't too long ago, I was at our seminary up in Pittsburgh at an ordination service, and this same young man, who was now a priest, so obviously someone had decided he was called, he was now an ordained priest, was the preacher for an ordination service, another guy getting ordained. And I sat there in the pew and I thought, well, this is gonna be interesting. And he preached the best ordination sermon I have ever heard in my life. 
the best ordination sermon I've ever heard in my life. And I told him afterwards. And he was shocked because, you know, we had some history. And I got back and I wrote him a letter. And I said I was wrong. I repent before God and before you that I didn't see what God saw. God calls, God sends. The church listens and responds. And we'll so often be amazed and perhaps even shocked at those God calls. First Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. It's not the charisma. It's not the credentials. It's not even the competency. It's the call from God. But secondly, pastors aren't just sent by the Holy Spirit. Pastors are strengthened by the Holy Spirit. And we need to have a maybe a bigger picture sometimes of what pastoral ministry looks like. Because verse 10 is kind of shocking. Look at verse 10 in Acts chapter 13, right? Paul bumps into this magician and what does he say to him in verse 10? Does he come along and say, well, you know, I think you're possibly going in the wrong direction. Would you like to sit and pray with me and we'll talk about this and, you know, and if, and if you don't feel like it today, I'll be, I'll be here all week long. We could talk and have maybe a cup of coffee and tell me, is there some history in your past? No, Paul says, you son of the devil. You enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy. Will you stop making crooked the straight ways of the Lord? And then he judges him. He, he brings down condemnation. He says, and behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind, not able to see the sun for a time. It doesn't seem very pastoral, does it? Did the church get it wrong in setting apart Paul? No. Verse 9 says Paul did this full of the Holy Spirit. Speaking with this strength and this boldness and this hard word, fully inspired by the Holy Spirit. In other words, he said everything he was supposed to in that moment. And you want to say, well, isn't the fruit of the Spirit love? Galatians 5 verse 22. Yes, and Paul, out of love, speaks this hard truth. Because there are lives on the line. Not just Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, who this man is trying to stop and turn away from the faith, but also this man, Bar-Jesus, Elymas, the magician. His life was on the line as well. Out of love for these two men, Paul speaks strongly and boldly this hard word. Because let's remember that when we're told that, that, that Elemis, which is what his name means, is a magi, and you may think, oh, that's like the magi that came to visit Jesus at the crib. You know, Matthew chapter two, we celebrate the magi. We sing songs about the magi. This guy can't be half bad. No, those magi were pagan foreigners from another land who didn't know any better. This guy's a Jew. We're told he's a Jewish false prophet. He was born into Israel, circumcised into Israel, knew the law and the prophets, and he chose the dark arts instead. This is a completely different story. This is a leader who has gone astray and is seeking to put other people astray. And let's remember that the harshest words in the Bible, the harshest words in the Bible are always directed towards false teachers. Ezekiel chapter 34, what does God say to the false shepherds in Israel? We're destroying the sheep. He says, I am against, God says, I am against the shepherds. Matthew 23, Jesus' harshest words, eight woes he speaks over who? The scribes and the Pharisees, blind guides, he says. The harshest words are spoken over leaders who go astray and thereby lead the church astray. And so Paul is speaking this hard word, son of the devil. Yes, he is. You know, bar Jesus means son of salvation. Can you imagine what the parents must have hoped for that child? Son of salvation. But Paul says he's a son of the devil and it's true. That's how he's acting in that moment as a son of the devil. That he's an enemy of all righteousness. It's true. That he's full of deceit and 
all villainy. Yes, he's practicing these sorcery arts. It's absolutely true. He is making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. He is opposing a lost sinner from being saved. Everything Paul says about him is true. And so he speaks in love in order to rescue Sergius Paulus, but Paul also speaks these hard words in love for Elemas as well. See, this hard word is actually spoken for Elemas' sake as well. He needs to hear the truth. Sometimes that's the most pastoral thing to do, to tell the truth, even when it's hard. See, the truth is for Elemas is that as you struck blind, there's mercy in that. Because Paul says you'll be struck blind and unable to see the sun for a time. It's not forever. It's a season of judgment in order that he can learn to repent, that he could see the error of his ways. And when Paul says this, he's speaking as a man who knows what it is to be struck blind by the Lord for a season so that you can turn and repent. This is exactly what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. And in fact, when he says, when Luke says that he was seeking for someone to lead him by the hand, that's exactly what it says of Paul in chapter nine, verse eight, that he needed to be led by the hand. This is Paul saying, I'm gonna see the Lord do for you what he did for me. You need to turn, you need to change just as I needed. And therefore sometimes the hard word is needed. We sometimes need to rethink what pastoral means. We think gentle, compassion, soft, listening ear, all true, but sometimes a hard word is the most pastoral word spoken into your life. You know, the word pastor from Latin means shepherd. And of course, the examples we get of shepherds Throughout scripture, Psalm 23, those shepherds have rod and staffs. Yes, to beat away all the wolves, but also that shepherd's crook that the bishop carries as a symbol of his office. I always say that crook is just big enough to get around my neck (laughs) to correct the sheep. It's pastoral. It changes the way we see our lives. A good word of truth is sometimes the most pastoral thing. Why would we separate pastoral from truth? You know, one of my favorite um, comics, I found it. I've been looking at it for years. I couldn't find it, but I finally found it the other day. That sort of describes this idea that doctrine is pastoral. Good teaching truth soothes the soul. It's this Peanuts, Charles Schultz comic. And you've got Lucy and Linus. And Lucy, the older sister, with Linus, her younger brother, looking out the window, it's raining. And Lucy says, boy, look at it rain. What if it floods the whole world? And Linus, who's always the theologian in these comics, says, it will never do that. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that would never happen again. And the sign of the promise is the rainbow. And then Lucy says, she says, you've taken a great load off of my mind. She's been pastorally cared for. What does Linus say to her? You've taken a great load off my mind. He says, sound theology, sound theology has a way of doing that. The truth sets us free. Paul understands that his call is to preach the word in season and out, to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort with all patience and teaching. But finally, it's not just that we see in Acts chapter 13 that pastors are sent by the Holy Spirit and strengthened by the Holy Spirit, but we see that the Holy Spirit speaks through pastors that he sends. He speaks through them. Look at verse 12, the amazing news. The proconsul believed. The result of this whole story is this man who was lost has now been found. This pagan Gentile has come to put his faith in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. That now suddenly Jesus' death on the cross for his sins has been activated in his life. He is forgiven. 
that Jesus' death and burial and resurrection has overcome the power of death in Sergius Paulus' life. That is now his, all because of what's happened here. The man has been saved. Why? Because Paul was so powerful, because Paul was so eloquent. No, we're told in verse 12, the man was astonished, which means amazed, astonished at the teaching of the Lord. What Luke is reminding us of here is that it's not Paul or Barnabas or any of us that are actually doing the teaching, but it is the Lord himself teaching. We need to remember that the best name title for this book is not the human-oriented acts of the apostles, nor the hyper-spiritual acts of the Holy Spirit, but instead the best way to title this book is the acts of the apostles in the power of the Holy Spirit. So you can just take your Bibles out and write that in. That's, that's the real name for this book. The Acts of the Apostles in the Power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit working through the apostles, through the church. Look at verse five. They preached the word of God. Verse seven, Sergius Paulus wanted to hear the word of God. It was the word that was doing the work. Friends, if you hear nothing else today, hear this that those pastors that God raises up have no power in themselves apart from the power that is in the word of God itself as wielded by the Holy Spirit. Those pastors have no, we pastors have no power in ourselves apart from the word of God wielded in the hands of the Holy Spirit. That is the power alone that works through the church for the salvation of souls. As Martin Luther famously said, He said, I simply taught, preached, and wrote. I did nothing else. The word did the work. So whether I slept or drank beer with my friends, the gospel went forth. The word had the power. The word did the work. This is the central understanding of who we are as pastors in the church. Simple conduits speaking the word of God, and that is the power unto salvation. This Bible was given to me at my induction as rector here. Archbishop Foley, when he ordains someone or inducts them, installs them in a new church, he, the tradition is we give a Bible. And he's supposed to just say, here's the Bible, preach the word in season and out of season. But what Foley does every time, and he did it to me, is he hits you on the head with it. Seriously, every time, I've watched it. He did it to me, it shocked me, I'd never seen it. I thought, whoa, here we go. Different kind of church. Hits me on the head with it and it keeps it there and then says, always, always stand under the word. This is the power of the gospel and of salvation. This is how the spirit speaks through the pastors that he sends and strengthens. And so, church, do you pray Do you pray for the Lord to raise up pastors among us? You should. See, the Lord is answering those prayers today. And I don't mean just like in 2022. I mean right here, right now. Because in the text we're told in verse two that it all happened while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. You know that word in verse two is literally the Greek word for liturgy. As they were saying the liturgy together, as they were praying Sunday after Sunday, the Holy Spirit breathed on his church and spoke and called forth those who were to be raised up and set apart for this ministry. And so he is doing it today in this space. And maybe for you, the Holy Spirit's not calling you, right? He's made, many of you Perhaps he's not going to be calling you. That's not the particular call on your life. You have another beautiful call. It's not this one. And you may say, this has been a waste of 30 minutes. Like, why did we preach on this? If that's the case, you haven't been listening. It is the church that hears what the Spirit says and calls forth. Your call is to share what you've heard when you hear another person's name on your heart by the Holy Spirit. You're to share that. You're then to support them. You notice that John Mark in verse 5 We're told he's there to assist them. We don't even know what that means, but he's there to assist them. The church coming alongside. John Mark will eventually write the gospel of Mark. We're gonna bump into John Mark in a couple chapters. It won't be good, it won't be pretty, but it's gonna be good in the end. 
John Mark is there to assist. You're called to come alongside, share, support, and be part of the sending and setting apart. But maybe for some of you today, it's your name that the Holy Spirit is speaking in your heart. Maybe he's calling you. Maybe you've heard it before. Many times I took five years to finally give in. Maybe it's the first time for you today. Have the courage to share that. Have the courage to step into that question and that discernment. And then find the courage, as verse four says, as the Holy Spirit sends, so they went. Friends, the Holy Spirit is calling forth laborers into his harvest field today. The Holy Spirit sends those pastors. The Holy Spirit will strengthen those pastors. And the Holy Spirit will speak through those pastors, through the performative power of his word today for the salvation of the world. Our world is desperate for salvation. Are you praying? Oh, church, are you praying? And as you pray, as we pray, will we respond in obedience? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.